Just days after grounding the MD-11 fleet, the FAA expanded its order to include every DC-10. One question drives this decision. Is there a single weak point in the DC-10's pylon design that can cause total structural failure? Let's check it out. The November 14th Emergency Airworthiness Directive is unusually blunt. In its opening lines, the FAA states that an unsafe condition exists that requires immediate action. The directive formally supersedes the November 8th MD-11 grounding and expands its applicability to include the MD-10 series, the DC-1010, DC-1015, DC-1030, DC-1040, their freighter variants, and even the KC-10 tanker series. Although the Air Force has already retired the KC-10 fleet, the fact that it's listed underscores how broadly the FAA views the risk across the entire design family. The wording is critical. The directive does not simply recommend inspections. It prohibits further flight until each airplane has been inspected and brought into conformity using a method specifically approved by the FAA's Continued Operational Safety Branch. In practical terms, operators cannot rely on their own engineering departments, maintenance manuals, or existing service bulletins. They must wait for an FAA-approved method or submit an alternative procedure for approval. Until that approval is granted, these aircraft are legally grounded. Another important detail is that the FAA labels this as an interim action. That usually means the agency expects further rulemaking, possibly more detailed or restrictive mandates, once investigators learn more. So this is only the first step. And because this directive is a direct response to a catastrophic real-world failure, the tone is cautious, even urgent. The FAA rarely grounds multiple large aircraft types at once, much less with this little information provided. All of that signals that the agency believes the underlying risk is truly immediate. The heart of the issue lies in the engine pylon structure shared by the MD-11 and the DC-10. Both aircraft use a very similar pylon design and both mount their engines at the wing using a combination of forward and aft attachment bulkheads, thrust links, fittings, and a multi-spar box structure that distributes loads into the wing's primary spars. This structure is far more than just a bracket holding an engine. It absorbs thrust forces, vertical bending loads, side loads, gyroscopic reactions from the spinning engine, and torsional stresses as the aircraft maneuvers, it also houses essential routing for electrical lines, hydraulic systems, fuel lines, and various control pathways. If any part of this system experiences cracking, fatigue, corrosion, or improper load distribution, the failure can cascade rapidly. In the case of the recent accident that triggered the first grounding, the left engine and pylon detached during takeoff. That means the entire assembly separated at or near the attachment points. The FAA's language in the emergency directive strongly suggests a concern about a single point of failure, a location where one crack or one broken fitting could compromise the entire load path. When a structure is designed with multiple load paths, one failure can be carried by the others. But when a primary load path is singular, or when secondary paths are insufficient to carry the sudden overload, one break can lead to immediate separation. What makes the pylon so challenging is that much of its critical structure is internal. The pylon is essentially a vertically oriented wing box. It has an upper spar, a center spar, and a lower spar tied together by ribs and connected to the wing through forward and aft bulkheads. These components can crack internally long before any visible signs appear on the skin or external fittings. That is why investigators, and now the FAA, appear to believe that a simple external inspection is not enough to detect the conditions that led to the accident. Adding to the concern is the existence of older airworthiness directives addressing wear points inside the pylon, issues involving chafing of electrical bundles, abrasion of fuel and hydraulic lines, and fatigue around fastener holes. Any one of these could create localized stress concentrations or introduce small damage that, over time, propagates into something far more serious. The FAA's decision to expand the grounding to the D, C-10, and M, D, 10, strongly implies that whatever failed on the MD-11 may also exist elsewhere in this family. The triggering event for all of this was the UPS Flight 2, 
976 crash. During the takeoff roll, the aircraft's left engine and pylon assembly separated from the wing. When an engine detaches, the sudden loss of weight, thrust asymmetry, and structural shock can render the aircraft uncontrollable in seconds. Cockpit crews have only moments to respond, and in the case of Flight 2976, the airplane was lost shortly after the first indications of trouble. One detail that has emerged is that the aircraft had recently undergone heavy maintenance. Investigators will be scrutinizing maintenance records carefully. Torque settings, bolt replacement, reinstallation procedures, structural repairs, and any work performed near the forward or aft pylon bulkheads. Historically, the DC-10 airframe family has had isolated issues involving pylon reinstallation. In earlier decades, improper jacking and lifting procedures during engine change operations were known to introduce structural stresses to the pylon bulkheads. While today's maintenance practices are far stricter, investigators will still carefully examine whether any misalignment, over-torquing, or installation damage occurred. So far, however, there is no suggestion of an internal engine failure. The CF-6 engine model used on these aircraft has not been flagged as problematic in this accident. There is no reported evidence of a turbine blade, liberation, or a compressor failure that might have caused the pylon to break apart. All current indications point toward a structural issue within the pylon itself, and that's why the FAA is moving aggressively before the NTSB publishes its full factual findings. When an engine and pylon separate during takeoff, the implications are clear. Unless every attachment point, bulkhead, and load path is verified intact, no aircraft of the same design should continue flying. That is the logic behind both the grounding and the scope of the November 14th directive. The FAA has not yet provided the approved inspection procedure, but the wording of the directive makes one thing absolutely certain. It will involve far more than a visual check. To examine a pylon deeply enough to detect the types of failures that could lead to separation, operators will need to use a range of non-destructive testing methods. One likely requirement is ultrasonic testing, which sends high-frequency sound waves through spars and bulkheads to detect internal cracks or voids invisible to the human eye. Eddy current inspection may be used around fastener holes, bolt bores, and the periphery of attachment fittings. This method induces electrical currents that distort when they encounter subsurface defects, making it ideal for detecting fatigue near bolt holes, the exact locations where load cycles are most intense. Radiographic inspection, or industrial x-ray, may also be required in limited areas, particularly around welds or internal structural junctions, although radiography requires significant safety controls and access. It provides a powerful look at internal crack geometry. Magnetic particle and dye penetrant techniques may be used for exposed metallic surfaces and welded seams, helping pinpoint smaller cracks that might propagate under load. The challenge with the DC-10 and MD-10 series is accessibility. Many critical pylon components sit deep inside the structure, requiring removal of panels, systems routing, and sometimes even partial pylon disassembly. This is time-consuming work that cannot be rushed. And because the FAA has explicitly restricted flight, until the inspections are approved and completed, operators will face significant delays before returning their fleets to service. Another complication is the need for consistent, standardized procedures across all operators. When the FAA mandates an approved method, it often means the procedure must be developed either by the original equipment manufacturer or by the agency itself. Boeing which inherited McDonnell Douglas's designs, will likely play a key role in defining these methods. That takes time, often weeks or months, and until those procedures are released, operators have no ability to begin inspections. The operational consequences of this grounding are serious and immediate. In the U.S., only eight DC-10s were still airworthy before the November 14th directive, and half of those belonged to 10 Tanker, one of the most important operators in America's firefighting infrastructure. These aircraft, with their ability to drop up to 12,000 gallons of retardant per mission, are some of the most capable heavy air tankers in the world. Losing even one is impactful. Losing four simultaneously, with no timeline for return, is potentially devastating, for regions that depend on rapid response aerial firefighting. On the cargo side, 
The grounding affects operators who rely on DC-10 and MD-10 variants for medium to long-range freight operations. While the MD-11 fleet was already grounded earlier, the expansion to the DC-10 adds another layer of disruption to supply chains already struggling with the loss of a major aircraft type. Companies operating these trijets will need to shift capacity to other aircraft, lease replacements, or temporarily reduce service. For the aviation community, this grounding also represents something more symbolic. The DC-10 and MD-11 families are the last of the large trijets still flying. They have served for decades across passenger, cargo, military, and firefighting roles. The November 14th directive raises the possibility that some of these aircraft may never return to commercial service again. If the inspections reveal widespread cracking or design-related fatigue, operators may decide the cost of repairs is too high relative to the aircraft's remaining life. But the most important impact is safety. The FAA's swift and aggressive action signals that the agency believes the risk of another pylon separation is real and immediate. Until the cause is fully understood and operators have a clear, approved path to inspecting and repairing their fleets, grounding these aircraft is the only responsible option. As the investigation continues, the next major update will likely come from the NTSB's factual preliminary report. That document will give us a much clearer picture of what failed, where it failed, and what investigators believe must change. It will also shape the FAA's next steps, whether that means a more detailed inspection mandate, a design modification, or long-term operational limitations. For now, all we can do is watch closely. The grounding of two major aircraft families in one week is unprecedented, and it underscores just how seriously regulators view this structural issue. As new details emerge, I'll keep you updated. Until then, fly safe and thank you for watching.